cursor. Won't you listen to reason? everyone and welcome to another enticing episode of the atheist experience i am your host russell glasser and with me today is martin wagner how to do uh that is the first time i've seen the new intro nice uh, i because i always listen on podcast i don't want to see everybody's face mm, but uh, yeah, I can but i have to say that looked awesome so it, if you're indeed. like if you're like me then uh you should at least check out one show yeah. uh, on on uh yeah, the, the what tv right. right yeah uh, today is April. Uh, today, <laughs> today is Sunday. Off to a good start already. Aren't today we? is Sunday, May second. I still have my intro left over from the show I didn't do last month. Uh, <laughs> let's see. So today is uh, May second, and uh, we are a live call-in public access atheist television show based in Austin, Texas. We take calls from the local Austin area, and thanks to the audience on our live internet stream, we take them from all over the world as well. The Atheist Experience is sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. You can find out more by visiting www.atheist-community.org. And when you do, be sure to check out the fact page for answers to frequently asked questions. This show is live every Sunday from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Central Time on Austin Access Channel 16. If you would like to watch us live outside of Austin, simply visit the official Atheist Experience website, www.atheist-experience.com, and click on Live Stream at the top of the page. You can also participate in a chat room during the show. Uh, also at the website, you'll find audio and video from past episodes. If you click on Archive, you will find a list of programs that uh, um, have already been played. Um, and there's a podcast. You can catch fan-selected clips of the Atheist Experience on YouTube. And you can also see full episodes of the show at blip.tv, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, or you can subscribe to the audio podcast. And in addition to that show, the ACA sometimes sponsors a bi-weekly internet audio <laughs> podcast Maybe we should leave the bi-weekly part out of that yeah. uh, because it's been really erratic. Sponsors lately. a rare internet <laughs> audio <laughs> yeah. podcast called The Nonprofits. We're actually working through changing the schedule around right now. Uh, so it's up in the air when uh, the next episode is going to be, but there's going to be one. Mm. We haven't all died. Delonte St International Studios has not burned to the ground. Um, <laughs> So that's a relief because it's kind of a fire trap. <laughs> yeah, look at the place. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I um, thought I lived in clutter. We love Matt. It. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, anyway, weekly meetings for the atheist community of Austin are hosted at Romeo's on Barton Springs Road from 11:30 to 1 every Sunday, except for the first Sunday of the month when we host our lecture series at the Austin History Center, located at the corner of 9th and Guadalupe. Uh, there was a lecture scheduled for this morning, but uh, instead of a lecture, we did an election. And uh, it turns out that Matt is still president, having uh, failed to be overthrown in a bloody coup. Wow. Um, and uh, the board members are now uh, many of the same people there were before, but uh, they're Jen, and there's David Tyler, Shelley, Keith, uh, Chuck Clark's back on, John Iacoletti, and the two Dons, Baker and Rhodes. Mm. Uh, so that's your rundown for the election. So you're saying we're stuck in a rut, right? <laughs> it's the status quo all over. Again. Yeah, yeah. It's we're, we're just too, we're conservative here. We're just too conservative at right. the ACA. That's exactly it. Sorry. Yeah. We get letters all the time to the show saying, "Stop being so conservative." What can you do? We like it that Should way. Call this the conservative atheist experience. Mm -hmm. um, 
If you can't make it to the morning meetings, you can always join us for the much cooler meeting, which is dinner right after this show. Uh, I'll be there. Uh, Martin, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. probably be there. There's mm -hmm. a pretty good studio audience right now, and the people from the crew, they'll all be there probably. Uh, so anyway, if you want to do that, you can come on over to Thread Guilds at 301 West Riverside Drive, 6.30 p.m., half an hour after the show ends. Um, and uh, come on down and hang out. Uh, finally, the ACA also hosts an Atheist Happy Hour every Thursday beginning at around 7 p.m. at the Dog and Duck Pub located at the corner of 17th and Guadalupe. If you'd like to get in touch with us but don't feel like calling in, then you can always email us, and many, many of you do, Yay. tv at atheist-community.org. We get tons of emails. We don't answer them all, but we really try hard. We do. Um... Be sure to check out the unofficial show blog at atheistexperience.blogspot.com without the hyphen uh, and uh, the comprehensive counter-apologetics wiki at ironchariots.org. Uh, there is one special announcement today, which is that two weeks from today, uh, on May 16, 2010, um, instead of uh, the normal morning meeting, we're mm -hmm. actually going to do a rally because the State Board of Education... Uh, you might have heard are idiots mm -hmm. here in Texas, and uh, we're protesting that because we're against idiocy. Yeah. In conjunction, there's Do you have other anything to say? What? No, there's other groups, though, right? I mean, yeah. it's going to be a whole bunch of us. Okay. Yeah, right. I think uh, um, isn't, to, it just in to some official capacity, aren't like some of the, the CFI folks going to be there and uh, AA people? <laughs> Don't ask me that okay. question. Well, because I've uh, just seen a different groups uh, um, sort of all coming together for this. All right, this. well, that's cool. Part well, of the benefit be nice. of living at the Capitol, where all the idiocy yeah. is, is housed. <laughs> but this is about uh, the State Board of Education uh, doing their Jefferson. little right, right wing uh, <laughs> revisionist history in the Texas tech book, right. textbooks. They've, they've been doing it for years and years. We've been involved with it since 2003. There's mm -hmm. you know the Texas Freedom Network that does fantastic work opposing yes. this. But maybe that's what I'm thinking of TFN, not yeah, it could be Texas Freedom not, Network, not um, uh, the CFI. Yeah, no, but. No. Uh, yeah, so, I'm, I mean, the latest thing they did was, uh, and by the way, if you want to call in, I think neither of us have a particular topic that we're burning to talk about, so yeah. uh, you can go ahead and put up the phone number anytime, and we're just going to sort of wrap until uh, we yeah. get some callers in. And they're starting to pot come in, so. Uh, so the latest thing they did was social stuff, or like history stuff, where they, they wanted to take out, they, they wanted to have less Jefferson so they could make room for more Newt Gingrich. Pretty and much, it, yeah. That's about the summary. Uh, the idea is just sort of downplay the uh, role of non, you know, white-skinned Christians in the country's history. Right. Well, and, I mean, uh, Jefferson <laughs> was definitely white-skinned, and mm -hmm. he was something. He, but they, they, he, he did say that he was a Christian in the only meaningful mm -hmm. sense of the word, which was that he agreed with the dude named Jesus. Right. But, and then but wrote in a revi you his know, own version of the Bible with no miracles. <laughs> right. Which is like this long compared to... But, um, but they, they've, they've also done things like, uh, you know, suggest that it's not really all that important for students to learn about people like Cesar Chavez and uh, Thurgood Marshall, but they want them all to know about Phyllis Schlafly, right? Oh, so yeah. It's I really just, want to know about her. So, uh, now what's happened is that there has been something of a shake-up. The most recent elections of the recent Republican primaries, Don McElroy uh, was given the boot. Right, but and he's uh, not out yet, right? He's not out yet. So right? he's going so out in a blaze of glory. Yeah, so, that he's, you know, so um, more moderate Republicans have come in to uh, you know, fill that kind of extremist, ultra-right-wing, fundy teabagger you know, domination of the, the SBOE. It, it really has made the state an international laughing stock that we have this State Board of Education you know, run by very poorly, if not completely uneducated people. And so um, you know, it, it's been now over several years with the evolution in the science textbooks, and now they're taking on history and social studies you know, to try to do this whole right-wing whitewash and, and <laughs> revisionism. And so... Um, and, you know, we're, yeah. we're it, a whole bunch of different groups have been protesting this. And yeah. they're never going to stop until the rest of you Texans take more of an interest in your local school board elections. Yes. Because school board elections appear boring, but then 
uh, the, but then the fanatical right wing says, oh, this election is really, really important for the future of our children, by which they mean somebody else's children, because they all homeschool, mm. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, then, and then they get in, like, fundy people who, yeah. uh, who then set the agenda for the rest of the country. Well, you get somebody like Cynthia Dunbar on there who has, you know, written a book where she says that... Uh, you know, public education is some evil tool of the state, and you know, it's like, oh yeah, yes. this, well, this is I mean, somebody case in point. Yeah, this is somebody that you want on the state board of education, shepherding, you know, actual public education in Texas. Somebody who wants to completely demolish it right. um, instead of improve it. And uh, so we don't need some of that. We don't need the ideologues. We need people out there who are going to be fair, and they're not going to think that uh, education is all about politicizing people's kids. So yep. So, so I'm gonna that. I'm gonna take a quick call from Don in Let's Toronto. Let's do that because he's our be a slow call. He's I'm our first guy. No, yeah. maybe fine. I think he's been on for a while. Don, are you there? Hi there. How are you doing, guy? I'm good. How are you? Uh, doing fine, thanks. I just have uh, I'm I'm an atheist myself, but I just have kind of a tongue-in-cheek argument against the argument that the Christian God is immoral. Um. So okay. So against the argument that he's immoral, you're arguing. That he's beyond Four. morality. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you, if you believe in the concept of a Christian God, it would be ineffective to kind of argue that uh, the God that's depicted in the Bible is uh, an immoral creature, because if the Christian God is supposedly omnipotent, everything it does, it can also undo. So, it, so uh, morality is kind of a moot point for, for God it, with that uh, capability. And... Um, so God being immoral is kind of the same as a human thinking about destroying something and then unthinking it. So I think that's why Christians kind of don't accept that uh, their God is immoral. How do you think well, about that? It's sort of a larger version of President Nixon's, well, if the president, if the president does it, it's not illegal. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Well, you know, the little problem there is that, of course, well, if God can't, if God can undo every single thing He does, then He's not really omnipotent because that would mean that there wasn't something that He could do that He could not undo. Right. Yeah, that's why. That's yeah. why the concept of an omnipotent God is totally absurd. Mm -hmm. right. But uh, well, yeah, you said it was tongue in cheek. I don't know. I've never actually though heard a, a, a Christian phrase it in the way that you've done. Um, I think usually what they do is just wave their hands and say, oh, well, you know, God doesn't count because he's beyond all that. And they don't feel they have to sort of explain it anymore. Right, which, you know, is, just, which is why I don't like to argue in a general way, you know, I think God is immoral because then we just get bogged down in this swamp of, you know, where does morality come from and stuff. But instead, mm -hmm. I like to go to specific concrete examples like would you kill your son if God told you to. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorites. Right, so... So anyway, it seems to me that uh, the Christian God probably doesn't understand about morality. That's why he sort of seems so immoral as far as he's picked in the Bible. Anyway, <laughs> that was just my, my two cents on it. Okay. okay. Thanks right. for calling. Thanks. Appreciate it, Don. Thanks. See ya. Um, so a month ago, actually, when I was going to be on, I was scheduled to go uh, to be on on Easter Sunday. Uh -huh. But it turned out there was no show on Easter Sunday for whatever stupid reason. No, um, we, usually, we usually have one, though, don't we? Well, I don't know. We didn't have one last month. Because there are changes showed up and uh, or having failed to read the web page updates. <laughs> And, uh, but it, it was no problem. I was actually coming home from church. <laughs> I decided uh, for fun, uh, you know, uh, my fiance Linnea is actually from California and has not been to a real Southern Baptist church. And I thought, hey, I know a Southern Baptist church. Kyle Miller's church, Great, Hill ba Great Hills Baptist. Some of you may remember Kyle yeah. from the program a few months ago. Um, so I went to an actual Easter service at Great Hills Baptist Church. And then okay. uh, a couple days later, uh, you know, I, I bumped into Kyle at church, and then we all went to lunch together. And was he surprised? <laughs> he he was. He didn't seem that surprised. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he seemed to, eager to get us into more. So, like, oh, I'm sure he did. Uh, yes. You know, uh, later that week, um, the guy who wrote "I don't have enough faith to be an atheist" was supposed <laughs> to make an appearance at the church, uh -huh. and uh, we meant we wanted to go to that, but then we realized like it was like rush hour on a weekday, and we were like, nah, mm. I don't want to go to it that bad." Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that'd be interesting. But you know, we all went to lunch and talked about 
faith and and not having any and uh you know i i still think what i thought on the show which is that kyle is an incredibly nice guy that i like to hang out with and he's um you know he's not what you would expect of your typical southern baptist he's very mm -hmm. friendly very accommodating still very insistent about the faith stuff but mm -hmm. uh okay. but you know fun to talk to yeah. and that's part of what a lot of people found so frustrating about the show he was on is they wanted a bloodbath and didn't get it yeah yeah <laughs> i know they they were sort of uh, you know just in in the chat I was, I was watching on ustream that day and in the chat room they were all sort of calling for his entrails to be strewn about the studio <laughs> right and you weren't doing it enough to there so we can never please the chat room when there's yeah. not blood we're sorry guys but um yeah so <laughs> it's uh now this is we've done you know i grew up in uh, uh in, as went through my adolescence in a you know texas baptist church okay yeah and i have fond memories of those days right and people, right. a lot of people are always surprised about how you know i did yeah i enjoyed it you know within in, involved in the youth activities we did lock-ins in the you know, rec room thing, and I, went, I, I think when I was 13 years old, I went to summer camp with the, the whole, and, uh, you know, that was all fun stuff, but, um, but then I remind people, yeah, but the enjoying the activities and what have you uh, is an entirely separate issue from, well, is any of this stuff true? Right. And uh, so that's really, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road. Uh, you know, in the, uh, I can certainly acknowledge that you, you lots yeah, of nice right. folks, and fun to talk to, and, you know, the, the church environment, I can see why a lot of people consider that very positive. Uh, and, I, I mean, we did talk about that some at lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the things that I uh, noticed when I went to his church, you know, first of all, it's Easter Sunday. So mm -hmm. that's the day when every Christian comes that hasn't been for the rest of the year. And so the sermon is tailored to uh, make everybody feel really guilty. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be like, you know, you don't want to be a part-time Christian. I mean, you know, I'm not naming anyone in particular, but, you know, right. you you want to devote your entire life. You know, you, you shouldn't <laughs> expect it to be easy. Oh. Um, yeah. And then there was a particular thing that came up in the sermon, which was something like, you know, you can't expect, I, I mean, God is under no obligation to fulfill your intellectual curiosity. Which, to me, yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, simply meant stop asking so many questions. Exactly. And just that's believe. exactly what it means. Yeah. Now, Kyle assures me that's not what he meant, and there are all kinds of arguments. You know, good, uh -huh. good solid reasons for believing in God, yeah. but I don't feel like we got to any. Well, yeah, right. So, I mean, and, uh, you know, he'll, they'll tell, it's like, oh, well, that's not really what I meant. See, when you, this, you, you, you they'll... He'll, uh, you know, he'll, he'll. When you call him on the things that he says, he'll fall back on that sort of thing, and then you just kind of have to go, well, what did you mean? Right. And, but uh, anyway, uh, and that's where um, the fun can begin. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's see. Um, who's next? Kevin's waiting. Kevin in Orlando, and that's line two. Mm -hmm. Kevin. Hello. Hey, Hello. you're on. Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, great show. Um, I'm an atheist myself, and I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask you guys. Um, hello? Okay, yeah, you, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, you're on. You're good. Go on. Go did, on. Did we lose Kevin? Kevin? Oh, well, that's us. I think we lost Kevin, but we, we have could, his... We know what the question is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you called us to ask about <laughs> this supposed recent... How many does it make this time now? <laughs> Noah's Ark has uh, now been discovered something like three dozen times. I don't know. There, there was an incident in Turkey where there was act an actual... I mean, this was like mm -hmm. decades ago, but there was, there was a guy who was an actual deliberate fraud. Mm -hmm. He got this wood, right. and then he like boiled it or something to make it look old, and then mm -hmm. he took it to some organization that looks up... Uh, you know that that tries to justify these Christian stories. Sure. And and then you know even after he said it was a hoax, they didn't say anything. <laughs> right. I, I mean you know they they wouldn't let scientists examine it. Now this time around, mm -hmm. uh, and of course it's sources like Fox News and World Net Daily are re reporting on this. No legitimate news outlet is reporting on this. Right. But apparently <laughs> uh, earlier this week there was yet another discovery. Ooh. Of what uh, the discoverers are claiming is Noah's Ark on a mountain in Turkey, uh, and uh, they've supposedly, this is interesting, they've carbon dated it to 4,800 years old. This is their the claim. Yeah, so, so isn't now they believe. <laughs> yeah, isn't it interesting? Now, suddenly, carbon dating is something that Christians accept, right? I mean, you try <laughs> to show them fossils, and you try to show them all different sorts of uh, archaeological, uh, you know, 
uh, proof and paleontological uh, evidence for, uh, well, this is how we date dinosaurs, and this is how we date the strata, and they say, oh, well, that's just fake, it didn't work. And then, but, right, oh, and no, they, when it comes and to... And they say, don't you know that carbon dating yeah. has been proven to be completely unreliable? Yeah. Why, there was this rock that I dug up 10 minutes like, ago, and it was 70 <laughs> trillion years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like when you carbon date the, uh, you know, the Shroud of Turin, to, the, yeah. you know, to demonstrate that uh, you know, the cloth doesn't go back much farther than, say, the 13th, 14th century, then carbon dating is a fraud. Right. But when it comes to, oh, but <laughs> suddenly it's not a fraud now when it's their arc. Yeah. Here's the thing. Um, discoveries like the Shroud of Turin and Noah's Ark are really great ways that you can witness this odd sort of love-hate relationship that fundamentalist Christians have with science, right? I mean, on the one hand, they really disdain science because it's science's job, essentially, to piddle all over their beliefs, right? You know, um, they have, you know, whatever their religious, you know, uh, teaching tells them about the history of the world and where people came from or this, that, or the other thing. Uh, along comes science with all of its, you know, research and its evidence and everything else. Uh, and, you know, sticks its little willy right in the middle of it all and spoils the fun. So they really have this disdain for science. But at the same time, they recognize, well, in a contemporary, modern, rationalist culture, rationalist society, you kind of have to have some scientific backing because that's how you're legitimate, right? That's, you know... It's, it's a lot like what I was saying uh, uh, when I went to Peoria mm -hmm. a few weeks ago and uh, got to lecture and basically do a, sort of a live version of the atheist experience with Matt, uh, one of the things that I brought up in my talk was, uh, you know, they used to think, you know, s the Egyptian culture used to think they knew the answer to why the sun moves across the sky. It's mm -hmm. because Ra carries it in his barge. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't want to seem closed-minded here. How many of you guys think that Ra carries the sky around, the sun around in his barge? And, uh, you know, the, the thing is, these answers eventually fall out of favor. And, uh, I, I mean, you know, people eventually wind up at the scientific answer. The, oh. the scientific answer has general credibility among people, even if they don't want to deny it. I, I mean, even if, they, even if they do want to deny it. Mm -hmm. Um... Let's see. But th that's the the point is they recognize in science an agent of prestige, mm -hmm. right? I mean, right. as much as they can't stand evolution, it's an as much as they can't, yeah, they understand. All right, well, this is how this is how we have to go about things in order to be accepted in, in today's world. So. This is why you get things like the Turin Shroud, and this is why you, you see constantly see creationists trying to reformat create old school creationist beliefs into things that like intelligent design well, I mean, make it sound all it scientific creationism yeah. first when just creationism didn't fly. Right. So so creationism <laughs> evolved basically into more and more sciency sounding uh, beliefs. Uh, in an effort to sort of gain legitimacy. And then, but at the same time, they always wanted to bypass the actual scientific method, right. which is, you know, experimentation, peer review, you know, have it, uh, and just have it legislated directly into the classrooms without having had any right. of their so, ID go through the actual process of rigor that you have to go through to say, oh yeah, this really works and there's evidence to back it up. So in this particular story, case in point, <laughs> right. there, there was a group of Christians that held a news conference to announce that they were 99.9% .9 sure <laughs> that we had found Noah's Ark. Now, as no. far as I can tell, that's not any different from them just saying, we're pretty darn sure. But, <laughs> but sticking a number on it. Now, I no. mean, if, if I was going to make a pseudo-scientific fake press release, then I would say, like, you know, we're 92.7% sure, because that uh -huh. would, you know, that would sound like uh, not a number that you just made up. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you sound like you spent a little more time making it up, <laughs> thinking about it to make it up, then, you know. Right, but they're 99.9% .9 sure, okay. which, is, which is pretty darn sure, but I mean, you so know, what you about know, this finding faith makes means them... that you can be 99.9% .9 sure about everything, because mm -hmm. if it was wrong, then God would have led you astray, and that's not possible. Yeah. Well, there's a 99.9% .9 chance of that. So uh, what was the evidence that uh, what, makes them think it's 99.9% .9 likely that this is <laughs> Noah's big boat? That's a good question. Boat. I wish I were more up on this story, because... Was, uh, was there fossilized know, the uh, Triceratops, too? I, I mean, see... Um, hmm. 
maybe the of course this is having a hard time news finding that, that I'm yeah. coming from. Okay, <laughs> so it's not actually a news article. Yeah, but I see that Dr. John Morris, who I believe is the spawn of Henry Morris, who okay. made up the term scientific creationism, is the lead archaeologist oh. at the <laughs> Institute for Creation, Creation Research. Research. Yeah, that's uh -huh. the one. <laughs> oh no! Wait. What's and John Morris says, I'm leaning towards that the Chinese people have been deceived. Oh, so he's oh the boy. point one. He's taking the point one side that this might not be the thing. Is that what he's saying? Yeah. You have okay. this actual ICR guy saying that this might not really... <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a schism. There's a rift. Dr. Randall Price, head of the Judaic Studies at Liberty University, which is <laughs> Jerry Falwell's outfit. Don't you love this? We have fake newspapers, <laughs> fake websites, fake universities, fake <laughs> science. This is great. Has, and it's reported hey, as no wonder they like news. fake hair and fake boobs. And I mean, it's just wonderful. Has been a cohort of the Noah's Ark Ministries international team until two years ago. He pulled out of the project, sensing they were being taken advantage of by Kurdish guides <laughs> who have turned <laughs> ark searching into a cottage industry. <laughs> uh, that is just, I mean, you just, they can see them coming from a mile away. Oh so, boy, here comes some more of those yeah. white American Christians. Cha-ching, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Rand get the wood so Randall get Price, the who was in this thing up until two years ago, by the way, th uh -huh. this is a more recent story than the big press release. This, oh, okay. This, I just looked up the last thing I could find. Price said, I think we can't rule out the possibility that this is a hoax because a lot of things, the things that happen in the re that region of the world, and especially with the Kurdish guides that are involved, are designed to extract money from gullible people. Oh. Folks, Religious discoveries in a nutshell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, even if you... Okay, let's say... Okay, setting aside the whole uh, little problem that all of the creationists who believe in Noah's Ark that believe that it, it was actually settled on Mount Ararat mm -hmm. in Turkey <coughs> haven't really understood their scriptures very well, well because the scriptures don't actually say that the boat came to rest on Mount Ararat. It says that it came to rest on a mountain in a yeah. land called Ararat. Okay. You know, which is, uh, is one of those weird semantic things, but um, at the same time, <laughs> how would you know it was Noah's Ark? Even if you found a boat. Let's say that you went up a mountain and you found a boat. And maybe it was even a pretty big boat. Well, how would you know it was mm. that boat, right? I mean, do, would you expect to find registration papers in, in the glovey or what? <laughs> Saying it's Noah's? Would you expect to see a plaque? Yeah. Or graffiti, you know? Or, uh, how would, I mean... I don't know. <laughs> it's just wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> next we got. Well, see, right, we so lost that call. Think of Noah's Ark. We were even able to just go off on that call, even though we lost the call. That was fun. That's what's <laughs> just one of the wacky things that happens around here. <laughs> James in Woodbridge, New Jersey. Are you there? Oh uh, yeah. Hi. You guys there? Yeah, yeah we're here. Yeah. Um, um, the last comment you guys made, you probably find dung on the Ark. Well, yeah, well, well, you'd, I mean, dung. yeah, you'd think, or something, <laughs> some sort of yeah. traces. Well, anyway, on my um, animals. my question, um, uh, I'm I'm an atheist too, uh, but I haven't gone to church since uh, de December mm -hmm. because of um, sort of I it was a an option whether or not I can go every morning. I have. Christian parents, or one Presbyterian, and quite liberal at that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've been going in the beginning of the year, even though I knew I didn't believe it, mm -hmm. because of I wanted to do an Eagle project there. How but old now are you? My mom's like, um, I need to um, go back. Okay. How old are you? Uh, seventeen. Okay. So you're. Un unfortunately, like, still in that zone where they can tell you what to do, but only for, like, another year, right? Well, yeah, well, you know. my, my mom still is that little bit liberal where she'll say, oh, yeah, you can go, these people miss you there, and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> do they know you're an atheist, or are, are they trying to get me back there to save you, or do they just oh, think... Oh, no, no, it's, oh, okay. it's a pretty liberal right. yeah, Presbyterian. Okay. And the way my uh, pastor explained it um, once uh, was in deist matters, where there's this thing in the sky, and it's it's just there. It's just 
really not that he controls things or she whatever. Yeah, didn't but we have a thing recently where we talked about you know speculated on pastors and people who are actually in the ministry who, who, who don't, don't believe really themselves. believe that yeah. stuff? And it sounds like you have this waffling minister who just doesn't really have a whole maybe, heck of a lot of conviction. Maybe he's a sympathetic ear. Maybe yeah. you could just go to church and hang out you, with him. You might have more like converting <laughs> deconverting. Yeah, you could turn him into an atheist. Because he sounds but, like he's really uninterested. I mean, why why does your mother why is she so insistent that you go back to church? Well, she's sort of like, well, they miss you there. And okay. the fact that my sister just got back to church from being away from it, but not for the same reasons as me, because mm -hmm. I've seen what the church, like the ideas of the churches have done to her, and I don't want that same thing, the lack of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Like her friend talked her into witches exist or something like that, and it's just so <laughs> stranger to me. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you're worried about being corrupted by going back to church, uh, I would say that you're currently at a point where your defenses are up. So, you know, I wouldn't seriously worry about going back and just being persuaded. I mean, no, you know, no, I, I go back, I go to church yeah. voluntarily. I just said, like, last month. It sounds to me like James's worry is not wanting but, to disappoint or have conflict with his parents. Yeah, the whole well... Thing. And, um, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it just, it, this is a very common question that we get in emails from people. It's like, how do I deal with my family? And you're in a better position than most of them because yeah. a lot of them are like, you know, far right wing. Yeah. Uh, my family's really fundamentalist and they'd throw me out of the house if they knew that I was. Right. So you sound like you're in a little bit better position to just sit down and, and just, uh, you know, have a conversation with your folks about, you know, well, you know, what they believe and what you don't believe and why you don't believe it. And it could probably be a very positive, interesting thing. And, and if your mother is mainly wanting you to still be involved in church activities <coughs> for the social aspect and not losing your friends, um, you know, then uh, it, it could be not so much that she has a problem with you deciding you don't believe, but that, you know, she's worried about... Uh, you know, that you might you might be isolating yourself socially. Maybe you should get involved so, in another social group at high school and yeah. get her off your case. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> or, well, uh, they, yeah, it, it, I mean, like you know, said, there, it doesn't sound. I, the impression I get, James. Groups. I mean, just listening to you now, is that, that this is not really. This is just something that's bugging you, but it's not like this <laughs> crucial conflict in the household, right? No, nah, it's okay. just. Um, I hate making up excuses like, "Oh, I have my research to do for science research," or right. "I have a paper to do." I have to keep on saying that. Well, all right. You're going to have to keep up making up excuses until one of two things <laughs> happens, which is one is that you give in and go go ahead and go to church and fake it, or two is you can say, I'm not going to church and I really don't want to. Um, um, you know, I, I can't tell you which way is the, the right way to go for you, but, I mean, it seems like those are the only three options. You know, one, go. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, be honest. Three, mm -hmm. make excuses. Or you, again, okay. you could just say that, um, you know, you, you, you could say, well, I, maybe, unless you just really don't want to go, um, or you, you know, you could just, again, engage and just say, well, yeah, I understand that you'd like me to go because, you know, folks miss me there and, um, you know, and, and just and be completely honest and say, um, I just don't think I believe any of this uh, stuff anymore, what the church is teaching, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm really uncomfortable with the idea. Just say outright, I'll, I'll go, you know, if you really, really want me to, but it would just make me extremely uncomfortable. And, you know, then, because it sounds like you have a good relationship with your folks, that might make them maybe not really so insistent or maybe, maybe willing to meet you halfway. You see what I'm saying? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, Do you think the social aspect, uh, my mom's trying to, like, get me into it through the social aspect and just like uh, well that, that may be it I mean that may be it and not in so much an overt way or, uh, as thinking well maybe if he just goes there and has a lot of fun uh, you know he'll decide to go back sort of on his own kind of thing um, you know she may not be thinking of it in any kind of uh, you know sneaky nasty way this could just um, maybe she thinks that you're, you're, you're falling away from the faith because you aren't having enough fun at church. I mean, that could just be how she's looking at it. Mm. But as I was telling Russell earlier on in the program, you know, I have very fond memories of being, you know, early adolescent, early teenager, and, you know, to a kid doing church activities and being involved in that. But ultimately, um, all of those, you know, positive social experiences were entirely a separate question from whether or not any of the beliefs were true. 
And so um, you can tell her, look, I'll go back, and I like those folks, and it could very well be I could have a good times. But, uh, you know, this, there's a whole other question here. And that's, you know, do I believe in God and Jesus and what the church is actually teaching from a religious standpoint? And that's what I don't believe in. You know, it's a, you can tell her, I don't have a problem with, you know, the folks. I don't have, you know, I don't dislike anyone there. Um, you know, it's, it's not that. It's just another question. And that's why going to church makes me uncomfortable. You know, you could, um, you know, just... I, I, it sounds to me that just engaging your parents at this point and, and just trying to, you know, have an open conversation with them... Uh, <clears throat> might might make some headway for you because as you've described them they're not really pressuring you hard they're pr fairly liberal in their christian beliefs um so you know you could have a much much better chance to to, to meet them halfway than a lot of the folks who send us emails and call us in with exactly the problem you've got how do i deal with my christian family and i don't want to disappoint them that's always the worry it's it's a legitimate concern yeah. that they might wind up being disappointed after this conversation but look at it this way that conversation is going to happen someday. I guarantee it. And at that point, they're going to be disappointed. I, I just think there's no way around it. Uh, from my observations of other people like Matt and Jeff who've mm -hmm. had to interact with their parents after a conversation like that, it is awful at first and then gets better over time. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, it's not really a question of whether you disappoint them or not. It's a question of whether it happens now or later. And, uh, you know, if you were in a scary fundamentalist family where you could be thrown out of the mm -hmm. house or something, then I would say definitely not. <laughs> uh, but with this, you know, it's kind of it's up in the air. And you're right. And it's, it's sooner rather than later is probably better because it's the more you put a thing off where um, it's sort of known by both parties that there is sort of a, an element of conflict here, but we're just not talking about it and we're hiding, you know, we're, we, as, you know, maybe we'll hope it goes away. The more you put off a thing that really should be talked about sooner, then yeah, the greater the disappointment later on. So maybe get it all out in the open as soon as you can and it you know, won't lead to so much, you know, hurt feelings if you talk about it now rather than putting it off for years and years and years. And then it's like, well, we should have talked about this long ago. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I personally, I don't think it's a social thing because all the people that want me back there are just, um, what's it, um, I used to help out a lot there and mm. I'm like the oldest um, teenage male there, so it's like a, less of a workhorse, just like I help around with the kids and stuff mm -hmm. because adults get annoyed by the kids and sort of babysit them and stuff like that. Okay, I have some no. giggle at that, but I do. Um, All right, well, I mean, uh, you're a talented, car caring, uh, helpful individual, and obviously they don't want to lose you, but uh, the downside of being a talented, helpful, caring individual is that uh, if you're not careful, people can take advantage of that. And mm -hmm. it's your decision where to focus your talent. So, you know, you're going to wind up being talented and helpful to somebody down the road. And, and of course they're going to be disappointed if it's not them. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so we appreciate it, James. Good luck with all that. And uh, okay, we're going to go on to our next person. All right. Bye. See ya. Uh, Lisa is on in line Mesa, one. Arizona. Are you there? Hello. Hello. Yes. yes, there I'm here. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. Really hey. glad you took me. I'm a big fan of the show. Um, I had a question regarding, uh, I guess, clarifying um, an explanation for the purposes of discussing uh, the whole, the whole, uh, the, the, I guess, the, the, the idea of God's creation of the world, uh, whether or not he created sin. I've been having these round and round conversations with people, and it's been really kind of frustrating because I can't tell if it's a problem with my explanation or if they're just not getting it. So I thought I'd, I'd ask you guys. Um, the idea that God created sin by creating the law to which sin is contrary, um, that the, the, the suffering that we experience is a result of sin, which is a, a contradiction of the law, which uh, didn't need to be there at all, because if there was no law, there would be no sin and no suffering, etc. Kind of, kind of that idea. Um, it seems whenever I try to, to introduce this idea to Christians or to people, to theists in general, uh, it, it just turns into this, this circular argument where they say, well, God is just and God must punish sin, 
God cannot abide the sin, etc. And I explain that sin is not, you know, sin is not a real thing. It's just an opposite. Uh, it's just it's just a contradiction to the law. If there was no law, there'd be no sin, and there'd be no suffering, and there'd be no reason for any of it. Then it just goes back to, oh, yeah, but sin, you know, sin, evil. They have to punish evil and all of this stuff. And so I'm just not sure if it's my explanation that's the problem or what. I just wanted to know what you guys' thoughts on okay. that were. Okay, I have some philosophical background that might be helpful to you. Uh, do you know what, uh, d does the word euthyphro mean anything to you? Uh, I think that might, is that Euthyphro's dilemma, the, the, is yeah. what God does right because it is right or because God says so? Right, I mean, uh, it's, yeah. it's a dialogue by Socrates, which I think, or by Plato, about Socrates, that would, that might be helpful to read, but, I mean, basically what they're trying to do, I think, is give a sort of squishy definition of right and wrong where everything everything uh, that God decrees by definition is right. Uh, and it doesn't matter how we personally judge it. So, I mean, <clears throat> if you've got young children, move them away from the TV screen for a second. <laughs> well, you're not going to strip down again. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Last time you did that, No, no, not horrible, this time. Horrible, horrible. Okay. <laughs> um... But I, but I mean, if you if you ask a really out there hypothetical, like, is it if God told me to rape babies, would that be okay? I'm not saying for sure what their answer would be because I don't know what you know if there's. God would like, never say that. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Yeah, that's be, what a lot yeah. of them would say. But I mean, once you get. Uh, an individual action which is so horrific and repugnant that they're willing to say no that's horrible for its own sake and I don't even want to think about the idea that God would uh, order something like that they're basically not taking orders from God anymore they're taking orders from some internal sense of right and wrong and that there are some actions that just on in their own right are so bad that that they don't accept the idea of God suggesting that. So God's not the standard. Mm -hmm. Martin, well, you you've would been have a hard, furiously you have a really hard time getting them to admit, I mean, to actually give you a solid answer on that. I've tried, and, and they will always insist, oh, God wouldn't do that. It's a stupid question. It's, be, it's uh, contrary to God's nature or whatever. Um, okay. But, you know, of course there are individuals who would say if God tells you to kill your child or whatever, you do it because it's correct. Right. Of course, well, the same people that go on to make moral arguments about why God does or doesn't do stuff, which doesn't make sense because if everything he does is right, then he can do anything. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but, sure. Um, I mean, and I guarantee you that if there was a specific story that was about baby raping in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. they would find some... I thought there was. <laughs> Something about well, the virgins for yourselves or something like well, that? Well, there weren't babies, but yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Could have been, who knows? <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well just, to, just to give you an example, there's an ex uh, a conversation I was having on YouTube. Um, my reply to... Oh, don't have conversations uh, on YouTube. <laughs> Bad news. <laughs> oh, I don't even call those conversations. Exist. I have to reply sometimes. <laughs> no, you but, don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a never-ending whirlpool of... Yeah. <laughs> Stupid. Yeah, but this happens in real life too. You know, I have discussions with people okay. face to face, okay. and it just okay. just goes in circles. Well, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been trying to sort of organize my thoughts on this. And, okay. Um, it seems to me that if you want to take the um, Adam and Eve story seriously, uh, in terms of why in the world is there evil, the question that I would ask is: All right, it seems like if you really look at the story, and if you look about the fall of man in Genesis and all the rest of it. Uh, it's hard to escape the conclusion that these were results that God wanted all along, right? Because think yeah. of it. Why would God create this earthly paradise of Eden, right? You know, do all the little animals you know, hopping around being happy and, uh, you know, and, and everyone's in harmony and it's all beautiful and great. And then deliberately sabotage this earthly paradise by putting something in it, okay? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? This is what it was. Deliberately put something in this garden that Adam and Eve, you know, can, can sabotage, right? And then intentionally direct Adam and Eve's attention towards this tree by saying, don't eat from this tree. You know, and anyone who has young kids, and I've had Christians tell me that, well, well you know, Adam and Eve were so innocent, they were just like three-year-old kids. <laughs> well, all right then. What do you do? Any parent would know, Russell, you yeah. know, 
<laughs> tell a child don't do the thing and immediately it becomes the most intriguing, attractive, fun thing that they could possibly do, right? I mean, that's the kind of the kid's psychology. They have to sort of sure. see what it's all about. So God deliberately sabotages his earthly paradise by introducing this element yeah, of... And, you know, and, and if you have a two-year-old, you don't just yeah. say, hey, two-year-old, don't stick your finger in that socket. You mm -hmm. get the little child things that you put on yeah, the socket. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, but God... And then not only does God draw their attention towards the tree... You know, uh, but uh, he allows Satan in the form of the serpent to come in and work his little mojo on Eve, and and just how can any of this have gone on without God either knowing of it if he's omniscient and intending it? You know, because well, you know, you gotta, so you gotta it know seems like he, he must have been created uh, with yeah. a nature that. Uh, compels them to explore, or at least to you know to look at things that they're not supposed to look at. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of wonder when I hear about uh, <clears throat> our sinful nature being the cause of sin. How could our sinful nature be the cause of sin? How did how did we sin if we weren't already sinful? And if mm -hmm. okay. we weren't sinful. It's, now, it's just it's another circular thing. If I if I were having this conversation, this is the point where I would get kind of impatient and and like jump to why are we having this conversation? I don't think there is any such thing as sin. That doesn't mean I don't think there's anything as such thing as bad things that hurt people. Uh, but sin is just defined as stuff that makes God mad. And and if you haven't demonstrated to me that there's a God, then uh, you know then there's no such thing as sin until further. Uh, until further clarification. Yeah, I mean, the thing about um, these kinds of conversations is that they are all just sort of exercises and, you know... Yeah, I mean, I mean, the only reason... It's all academic. I mean, the only reason the morality topic ever comes up is because... Uh, is because... Um, Christians will throw out this absurd claim that there's no way to be good unless you believe in their God thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that just makes no sense. Um... And it's, it's easier to talk about why that makes no sense than to get caught up in this sort of esoteric philosophical question about why would God do this or that. Because honestly, I don't care why that fictional character would do this or that unless I'm in a literary analysis class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is just um, an exercise in hypotheticals when you're, you're, kind of, uh, you're kind of just throwing down... Uh, it, for the sake of the argument, let's say all of this is true. But it, it, it's so frustrating that they accept this system as being reasonable that you kind of just want to poke holes in it and show them that it's inherently contradictory. And why do? how can they defend this if they don't even understand it? Well, if you're going to... Which they clearly don't. If yeah. you're going to be, if you're going to let yourself be frustrated by people on the inter people on YouTube being unreasonable, <laughs> yeah, then you're in for a lot of frustration in your life. Uh. Oh, I'm afraid it's closer than YouTube. It's right in my family and uh, my uh, Okay, one of these. So, right. uh, well, yeah, yeah. I, I, end up, I end up having these circular conversations a lot with with real life people. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, you can't change their minds, probably, so you can only no. have those conversations or not have them well, no, I based mean, on how fun they are for you. Believers have their minds changed <laughs> all the time, right? I mean, it's yeah. tough, though. I mean, it's a, you're a lot of hard work. You want to know, I, the only thing that I could ask, uh, that I could say in response to uh, why they just accept this as reasonable is, uh, the only thing I can really think of is that these are authoritarian belief systems. They uh, define morality in terms of authority. Right? Not in terms of well, you know, what effects, what consequences do actions actually have on people. Morality is just a, a, a list of rules that comes from an authority figure. And so uh, in that kind of context in general, uh, you are just, you're someone who simply accepts things that you're told. Because that's the nature of accepting authoritarian rule you know, in your life. So, um, so that's going to be a thing that you're going to have to get around. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's probably better to go further back and try to attack the foundation rather than argue over the details. Hmm. Yeah. Just I mean, remember, they bear know, the burden of proof. It's kind of know. all about framing. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. thanks for calling. Yeah, we appreciate it, Lisa. Good luck. Let us know how that goes. <laughs> thanks yep. so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> sure. See ya. Uh, Surely there must be some theist uh, flailing around getting beaten to death in the chat room who can come here and defend himself. And <laughs> right. So, uh, a few mid-show announcements. I noticed mm -hmm. that the phone number to call us hasn't been up for a few minutes. No, so, there it is. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, it is. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. It has been on. Uh, we we uh, could use more callers. We've got one right yeah. now. Uh, if you are in Austin, um, don't be fooled by all these international calls. We especially love 
getting people who are local to us. That's how the show started out. So mm -hmm. uh, if you see the number up on your screen right now and you're watching public access television, whether you agree with us or not, especially if you don't agree with us, call in. Yes, please uh, do. And if you do agree with us, you can express your appreciation live in person in, uh, what is it, about 50 minutes yeah. by showing up at Threadgills on Riverside Drive in uh, far south Austin. Uh, where we'll all get together and have dinner and have a jolly old time. And mm -hmm. if you really don't want to call at all, but you would like to get in touch and have these kind of discussions with us, tv at atheist-community.org is the email address. Mm -hmm. Though not to devalue fans of our show who call in. We, we love right. to hear from you guys too, but... Yes. Yes, we all... Uh, and Steve in San Francisco, are you there? Yes, I am. Hey, Hi. thanks for waiting. Good morning. Hey, I have a quick question. I was raised uh, evangelistical, and uh, and now I'm atheist. And uh, I've always had interest in like the ancient aliens, and uh, they, they which maybe ones? they could have the influence on us on the the religions that we all have today. You mean you like uh, Von Daniken's claims and yeah, stuff like exactly. that? Exactly, Von Daniken, yeah. or even the most recent shows on History Channel, uh. of, uh, talking about more. The extremely the misnamed ambit, History Channel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I suggest that History Channel is a really, really poor source for these kinds of... For uh, history. <laughs> history, <laughs> yes. Um, well, you know that Von Daniken isn't really taken all that seriously, you know. By anyone. Um, here's, here's the thing about ancient aliens, right? Okay. Yeah, you know, wouldn't that be awesome, right? I'd love to meet aliens, it would, no matter what Stephen Hawking says about, you know, how they just want to eat us. I mean, no, I'd like to meet aliens. Um, <laughs> but, uh, again, it's, it's the same issue. Where is the evidence for this? And, uh, you know, where, uh, legitimately, that you can point to. And um, with a lot of these things that, are, that come up, uh, you know, whether it's crop circles, this, that, or the other thing, you just have to sort of analyze it, and then you have to think in terms of what we really know about the universe and about science, okay? Space is real big. And <coughs> so the whole idea of aliens coming here, you have to think uh, about a, a lot of ideas. For example, all right, you cannot, despite what Star Trek says, you know, exceed the speed of light. So you're talking about... At best, you know, you have this spacecraft full of this alien crew and they're flying at relativistic speeds from wherever the hell they came from. <laughs> and this basically means that while they're on their little ship piddling towards Earth, because apparently we're so interesting, back <laughs> home, right, their civilization is ending, right? I mean, all, everyone they know is dying. Every, you know, the, the uh, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years are passing uh, back home while, uh, you know, f for, for their own time. While they're space. going around dissecting yeah. cows and annually probing farmers. Yeah, and it's just sort of like, is this really worth it, right? So it's just, uh, you know, the, so uh, again, you have this, these, this alien crew is giving up essentially their entire lives to, to go on this crazy errand to this little pebble in, in our solar system. And then they get here, and what do they do? They make a pattern in a cornfield, and then they go hide. <laughs> yeah, well, that I'm, like I'm makes all kinds of yeah. Deep. That was totally worth the, you know de devoting an entire alien culture's uh, <laughs> you know space exploration budget for you know to <laughs> and these guys completely saying goodbye to their families. I'll never see you again. And by the time um, we get home, there won't be. To be, be any fair, you don't know that the aliens have the concepts of families and that. <laughs> They, well, but that they just, don't have infinite resources or whatever. Well, well but still, I'm just going sure by what, you know, yeah. the only thing we can go by is what we actually know that, uh, about the universe. Right. And, and, about and it's not that it couldn't so, happen, it's just that it's the same question as when confronted by the God claim, which is, what makes you think that happened? Yeah. Oh, no, but, I 100% agree with you. The <laughs> thing with, uh, is that, uh, of more, if, you know... If you look at cultures that, you know, at the one point the, all the gods spoke to man and eventually they kind of just disappeared. Yeah. And, you know... Well, they have to disappear at some point to explain the fact that they're not around messing with virgins now. Yeah. Um, I will say that there have been a lot, uh, there's a lot of science fiction that has taken this premise a, a lot of ways, right? I mean, 2001 A Space Odyssey is essentially what you're talking about, right? Not a to mention everything that yeah. uh, uh, the, the Scientology guy, Hubbard, yeah, or, Hubbard. <laughs> yeah, Hubbard wrote. basically created a religion based on exactly what you're, you're talking about. So the whole, and, and Scientology was a bet between L. Ron Hubbard and Robert A. Heinlein, two science fiction writers. L. Ron Hubbard bet Robert A. Heinlein that he could start a religion. 
Right. And so, um, so this whole idea of alien, ancient aliens affecting the culture and the religions of ancient people is, um, you know, a, one of those ideas that's, I think, a testament to human imagination. And uh, it's all about us uh, wanting to sort of find our place in the universe and come up with a way that we can relate to our universe to make it a little bit smaller, a, a little bit less vast and empty and cold and scary, and uh, have us be a little bit less alone in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just, uh, they're stories, but, um, you know, if, if you show me a legitimate ancient landing, you know, alien landing pad, uh, you know, give me the archaeological evidence, and, um, you know, until that happens, it's, it, it's all stories. You know. I got you. I got you. Well, thanks for that, guys. Uh, all, right. all right. Thanks, thanks for you. calling. Thanks. I was going to say, uh, in I was hoping off, we would get a little more fight out of that, but he's very reasonable. Yeah, well, um, yeah, we have reasonable callers on our show today. Damn. Damn it. We want unreasonable callers. Yeah. I was going to say, um, just to wrap up, terrific book. Uh, everyone should look up. Um, that I, years ago, it's actually kind of old, and I found it uh, bef you know, long before I was involved in ACA or something, but it's a really wonderful book called Frauds, Myth, uh, Myths, and Mysteries, Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries, um, Pseudoscience and Ancient Archaeology, and it's by a guy named Ken Feeder, F-E-D-E-R, and um, it was the first skeptical work uh, about pseudoscience and pseudoarchaeology and pseudohistory. Um, that I find it, and it deals with all sorts of these claims, uh, the, the Von Daniken's claims, uh, the ancient astronauts. The, he goes all the way up to the Cardiff Giant. Really wonderful, very entertaining, skeptical work where he just sort of, uh, you know, Velikovsky's thing with the, you know, planets flying around like pinballs. Um, he just takes it all apart, and it's very entertaining reading if you're looking for a, a good skeptical work specifically about ancient archaeology. So, mm. yeah, okay. and so, uh, all right. We we have so, callers on the line, but yeah. we uh, have connectivity. Uh, so, yeah. so I could talk more about. Tell us my, a little bit about trip uh, to Peoria. Do that, yeah, because we've heard some, um, but I don't remember what Matt has said already. But uh, ba basically, uh, we we did a couple of days there. Um, mm -hmm. We we each had about a twenty minute talk on the first day where I talked about uh, science and skepticism. So obviously that was where the raw stuff came in, and then Matt talked about uh, basically questions of value and why uh, atheist morality is superior, which I'm not sure is even a claim I'd make, but uh, he, he made a very good case uh, talking about... It's a secular morality. Right? Yeah, secular morality. Uh, okay. uh, and then on the second day, we just uh, sort of hit a bunch of fun stuff like the Star Trek rule and the, mm -hmm. um, you know, and just not, not so much like the kind of grand arguments that William Lane Craig or somebody like that would like to make, but the kinds of arguments that uh, that people calling the show actually would be likely to make. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like you better hope you're right. <laughs> um, uh -huh. had bumper sticker <laughs> apologetics, basically. Yeah. <laughs> We had uh, two, uh, l let's see, we, so on the first day we had a group of, um, I don't know what kind of Christians they were, but they were sitting way in the back. <laughs> that, that, was, that was the trend, is that the Christians, the Christians sit way in the back as if they're uh, thinking they will be set upon by the heathens. And, or know, just so they can get up and leave to make with a quick minimal disturbance escape. if, if yes. they decide that they don't want to <laughs> sit through this evil heathen um, rally. And the first evening, uh, you know, Matt went through his whole talk on secular morality, and their first question was, well, how can you be good without God? And Matt just sort of, you know, practically face-palmed right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we went through that a bit. Uh, the second day... <laughs> Uh, well, okay, it looks like we're getting callers again. But, yeah, but anyway, the second day, there, there were some Catholic philosophy undergrads, it seemed like, oh, in fun. the back. Okay. Um, so, so we got some interesting stuff going on there, including like a discussion that <laughs> um, that that was basically, um, don't you think? I mean, of the secular worldview and the worldview that says that you're going to go to heaven and be happy with God forever, which of them is more beautiful? Mm. And. Matt and I have completely different instincts on this because the the way that I went right away was, I don't think you're, you know, I don't think your stuff. I mean, you've got a hell and ridiculous arbitrary rules and stuff. I don't think that's beautiful at all. Well, you have a god who, uh, you know, turns 
people into pillars of salt. Right, and, and right. He's, he's a real <laughs> mean bastard, right? I mean, he's just, uh, if you read all of his yeah. just murderous exploits <laughs> in the whole Old Testament, I mean, it just looks like those were nightmarish times. Yeah, and to live beauty through. is completely subjective anyway, so, you know, that's kind of a gimme question because they hope that you'll, you know, that if they frame it the right way, then you'll say, oh, well, actually, your way is more beautiful, but I'd rather live with my barren worldview. <laughs> <laughs> And th I didn't go that way. And then Matt's, it, Matt's instinct was to jump in and say, I don't care if it's beautiful or not. Is it true? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, pretty much covers all the angles of that question. Sure, yeah. Uh, and then we had, like, a 30-minute discussion with them afterwards. You know, there were three of them. And right. <laughs> uh, so good times. So yeah, so so it turned out to be worth good it times. in that regard. Fun stuff. Yeah. Everybody who showed up, there were like forty or fifty people each day. Good. Uh, everybody good. seemed to have a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and then uh, and then we had a magician the next day that we attended, and he had like three hundred people. So we were like, uh, we're yeah. we're popular too. Well, <laughs> but yeah, you were maybe a little more scary. I mean, yeah. About that, you know, and. Okay. But we've been getting some more of this, you know, so this has been picking up a little bit lately, these requests for, you know, public appearances it's and true, stuff like there that. Are so that's a been lot. really nice. So and I uh, want to say, you know, Matt's not the only one who can talk. <laughs> I would do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, and Matt is doing all kinds of stuff, and I'm sure he's doing it again a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so. so. A uh, Andrew, I think, is next. Andrew in Sheffield, UK. Uh, and I know that I pronounce everything in the UK wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. How are you? Um, yeah, no, you, you pronounce that okay. Um, okay. Really, it's a, it's a call from... Um, I phoned a few weeks ago and talked to um, Don and, and uh, Jeff. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was pretty late on the show and only managed to talk to them kind of after the show had finished. Um, and it was basically about about Islam and um, the the kind of rise in Islam, kind of in this country and and probably in America as well. Maybe I'm I'm not too sure what the situation is like over there. Um, I wouldn't but say. The, I the mean, the question is, uh, as it's as Islam is pretty much a, a fundamentalist religion, and right. in the UK we we don't have <laughs> a fundamentalist Christianity to the same extent that you seem to do over there. Um, it's really just to get some advice on from you guys on to how I could best deal with with um, that kind of shall we say religious argument when I'm debating as as an atheist. Oh, you actually mm. get chances to talk to fundamentalist Muslims a lot. Huh? Um, my, and, from my point of view, and you view, still have a head, so Muslims are pretty fundamentalist, mm -hmm. um, and. So yeah, I mean, I do, I do, I work in education, so I come across quite a few um, oh, members okay. of staff who are actually, you know, quite devout Muslims, really. See, um, it, it sounds to me like a different situation there than here, because here, I mean, I think most Muslims in the United States find themselves having to stay pretty low key. Because well, it's less than one percent of the population here. Yeah, it's a very right? small I mean, percent of the population, and mm -hmm. in general. Uh, it's, it seems like uh, the Muslims I come into, I, I mean, first of all, we hardly get anyone ever calling the show as a Muslim. Uh, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, because I've, I've talked to some fairly extreme Muslim creationist types who mm -hmm. present the present the same type of arguments as the as the fundamentalist Christian types. And, and I will tell you that I, I would probably suggest, uh, you know, you're, you're encountering Muslim fundamentalists because they're the ones who are out there, you know, they're wanting to talk, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think um, probably I, realistically... I may have been a little bit wrong in, in kind yeah. of labeling them all together as, as all fundamentalists. Obviously, they, yeah, that, that includes a, quite a, a range. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the ones that I talk to do... Do accept evolution, um, oh, okay. and, and really, they, they are they are pr on the way to show we say secularism to, to a certain extent, but but not in not to the same level that um, you, you you kind of indigenous Christian population in this country is, which is mm -hmm. as you probably know, Christianity in this country is a very because because there isn't this separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. um, the Christian religion is is I think I think Jeff was spot on when I thought to him. The Christian religion in this country is very um, lazy, shall we say, um, and so therefore you you kind of haven't got a target to aim at. 
Mm-hmm. If you see what I mean, if you if you're trying to, uh, with the exception of maybe Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, that there's sure. nobody really out there to kind of um, deal with on a fundamental basis. Well, uh, you know, you have, have a Christian. you have a different situation also over there in in the UK than we have here, which is that. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't, but I I do believe that. Um, you know there are all, there are always uh, blasphemy laws to be wary of, and um, uh, I don't not, know to what not it, not in the UK in Ireland. So, uh, Ireland, I right? I'm, I'm pretty certain in thinking that that has just been overturned or it hasn't gone through or something. Oh, well, right. the, what, the, what we have in this country is um, we have uh, again. You may have it in America. I'm not too sure, but we have something called hate speech. Oh. However, it's not clearly defined. Mm. And yeah. simply somebody being very, very, gr- very, very aggressive in a, in a, shall we say, an anti-religious way, uh, mm. dare I mention Matt, might be a good example, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> over here, could be in a little bit of trouble if he was, if he, were, if he were to do a similar program over here, um, I don't know how long that that program would last, or even if it would be allowed. Right, and, and, um, and it, it's really quite serious in that respect in this right. country at the moment. But at the same time, I think that there has been this sort of pushback from, say, the the skeptical secular, you know, people who are activists in 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 skepticism and and unbelief. Uh, yeah, because yeah, we recently yeah, had the situation right. with the um, Simon you know, Singh. I, I don't want was, to. I don't want to. Kind of say that it's go- all going one way, um, right? But you have the situation with like Simon Singh recently was uh, sued uh, by a, a group of homeopaths uh, under a li- he he uh, suffered a libel suit, and yeah, um, yeah. and you know which and the, the homeopaths actually won simply because Simon Singh said this homeopathy doesn't work, right? I mean it's it's bogus, and there are studies showing it, and the homeopaths yeah. uh, just. And so the whole thing you have to understand about pseudoscience, religion, what have you, is you know it's it's all about well you know we don't have the facts on our side, so the way to deal with opposition is to simply shut it down. And there are yeah. laws over there uh, that in the UK that I do think sort of make it easy for that kind of shutting down of dissent uh, of certain beliefs easier. And yeah. what yeah. recently happened was that um, the the suit against Simon Singh, he finally got that was thrown out finally or overturned or reversed or what have you. And, mm-hmm. uh, and that was a really uh, terrific victory over there. For, and, and so now there's a big push in the UK for libel reform. I, th- I so think the problem with that was is that it, it, it should have been a lot clearer than mm-hmm. what it actually was. And mm-hmm. it took an immense amount of, of money and of different lawyers all working behind the scenes or whatever to, to try and you know, get, get that through in what was really or shouldn't have been a very complicated case. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's the huge problem, that in this country, there seems to be a lot of spin put on everything, whether it's religious or political or, or spin regarding law or whatever. You, and, and in America, from watching your program and many other programs, you seem to say it like it is a whole lot more than we do over here. Yeah, that, that's kind <laughs> of the trade-off. It too, actually. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of the trade-off is that it's kind of a breeding ground for BS. I mean, you know, yeah. It, yeah. it's... <laughs> You know, there, there's this enormous emphasis on freedom of speech and freedom to say any nonsense that you want, which I love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's great. Um, but, you know, that actually makes it easier for, you know, a million different splinter religions to form and all be at odds with each other. Yeah. And, you know, and you could say that's actually a good thing because they all keep each other in check. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and what we have here in the States, we, we have hate crimes legislation, but right. we don't have hate speech legislation because that runs up against our First Amendment. But mm-hmm. what you hear every time, okay, hate, hate speech legislation, every time it is brought... You know, up to uh, you know, before uh, you know, whenever anything like that is attempted to <coughs> to get through here, the the groups always going up against it are going to be uh, the Christian fundamentalists, uh, the the right wing conservative politicians, because they will equate the hate speech with hate crimes. They'll say, oh well, they want it to you know, well it's a precious part of our beliefs that homosexuality is a sin, and so if this law comes through, then we're, you're going to censor us from the pulpit. It's like, well, no, mm-hmm. you can continue to be raving idiotic homophobes from the pulpit, right? You just can't mm-hmm. engage in hate crimes, right? You can't yeah, incite yeah. people to go out and beat up the gays, right? That's a different yeah. thing, right? And so the actions are yeah. different from speech. And, and what you seem to be saying is that mm-hmm. there's not, that distinction isn't so. 
uh, clear cut. Uh, and it's, yeah. it, it's yeah, important to me yeah, that these... It boils yeah. down to if somebody feels, or if a large enough group of people feel that they have been offended in some way, it gets back to this point of being offended, mm -hmm. and they kick up uh, quite a bit of a fuss, then usually the law comes down on their side. Okay, mm. well, it sounds that like what's uh, the way it's that it's gone over here over the past few years. Well, then I think that uh, UK atheists and skeptics need to play that game then. If it's working for them, it should oh, work for you. Oh, okay, I see okay? where you're going with this. You know, you should say, we are offended at these intrusions exactly. of religious <laughs> indoctrination into the educational system. We are offended by, uh, you know, the way in which... Um, we are not allowed to speak our minds, and 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 that we have to uh, be confronted with, with uh, you know this threat of I mean they're blowing up the subways. We, you know, good lord, where will it end? You, right? You, yeah, you go ahead and go ahead and play you, that. As long as you 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 very careful in what you say, and mm -hmm. as long as you like when when I'm if I'm deb debating with with um, I've got a colleague who, who I work very close with who's who's a Muslim and. I can have virtually any any debate with him that that, that I want, mm -hmm. um, but I always make sure it's done in the context of I'm talking about religion generally because basically they all say pretty much similar things, mm -hmm. and I always emphasise that it's not just Islam, it's it's Christianity, it's Judaism, right. etc. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seems to be pretty pretty fine with that, um, and and so you know you 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 can actually have have a debate but you have to be very very careful and, and obviously you you can't come out and kind of insult or or call somebody an idiot or or whatever <laughs> um yeah. Yeah, so as long as you us. keep it, keep to the points, then it's yeah. pretty much okay. And and that's a perfectly legitimate way to have a conversation. But the problem I see with it is that it precludes the sort of conversations that we like to have on the show, which is okay. Let's start by you telling me what you believe and why you believe it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think you can necessarily. I mean, I don't think it's an easy task to argue with religion as a you know, giant block of stuff that all religious people believe because there yeah. isn't any particular thing. I mean, there there is no unifying uh, central theme that that ties together both fundamentalist Muslims and Unitarian Universalists and Jainists and whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, we generally like to go after not... You know, oh well, you are religion X, and and all people who are religion X are like this. I just mm -hmm. like to restrict it to the yeah. guy I'm talking to. What do you think? <clears throat> and does that make does that really make any sense? Well, yeah, um, yeah. And you know, well, if, if this kind of it, thing it, would it, lead it, to it, somebody, it's very, it's very difficult. And yeah. obviously, if you if you try and pick on something that is specific to a particular religion, especially Islam, then you are you are classed as being, if not racist, you're classed as being an Islamophobe. Oh, boy. Right, see, and this is why, this is the problem... You've ever seen any of Pat Condell's yeah. videos on, on YouTube? Oh, yeah, he actually, yeah. He actually deals with the term Islamophobe very, very easily mm -hmm. in the respect that if you look at the term phobia, it means to have an irrational fear of something. Right. Now, there is nothing irrational about fearing somebody who can blow you up death yeah. threats right. for dressing Muhammad up in a, in a, in a bear costume. Yeah. Now, right. I, I like Pat you know. Condell, but uh, I, I think he has a tendency to go too far in the other direction and come off as kind of a douche. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you know, he actually you know, winds up advocating a, a lot of things that don't make any sense to me, like we should, uh, you know, we should just go, just eliminate radical Islam, and we should start with, like, not letting anybody wear burqas ever. And, like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not I, comfortable I think, with that. I think you've got to understand the, the British mental, or the European <laughs> mentality, to, to understand where, where Pat's coming from with mm -hmm. that. It's... Um, it's it, it quite quite often when 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 Muslim women you 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 get a strong impression that when Muslim women are um, or or anybody really is wearing any kind of religious clothing that it's it's worn 
with a certain kind of intent. Okay. And it's, it's one with an intent to separate them from the rest of society. Right, but I mean, I don't even care about that. I mean, you know, I care about people being free to do what they want. I mean, my, my point of view is, you're free to wear your silly little headgear, and I'm yeah. free to call it ridiculous to your face. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. And, exactly. and you don't but have you that. And, and the problem that you're, you're what, you, what, uh, the problem I have with what you're simple. talking about when it comes to, uh, oh, you, you just have to watch what you say, Right then and there, what you've got now is a system that uh, is already sort of skewing any kind of... You, you have a really false uh, uh, arena for debate there. Because yeah, you really yeah, cannot, I, you, once, I, I once you say, once you say you're free to debate... And this is why I, I, I would say, uh, you Andrew. know... <laughs> I don't, I don't think I just you want can to get tell this when you're talking. No, okay. It's, um, I, I was just going to say, not to cut you off, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it is already skewing the arena of debate in favor of the believers and of the, the theists because it is, yeah. giving, it is already giving them sort of a leg up by saying, all right, well, I'll be happy to debate with you, but you just can't say anything to offend me. Well, right then, yeah. I don't think yeah. you can have an honest debate, and, uh, and that's not really the sort of thing I'm interested in. And I think that that is kind of a thing that you sort of need to change. Yeah. It's like, you're a, a, we are free to offend each other. Nobody has yeah. the right to go through life expecting never to be offended by everything yeah, and, or anything at all. 100%. And so that, and, I think, and, is a basic thing that has to change. All I would say, guys, is just hang on to that First Amendment because it is so absolutely vital. Mm -hmm. It really is. Right. Well, um... We wish you luck with all of okay. it, Andrew. And it's, it's Good great luck. To you. I like the show, and I'll keep watching, and I'll send a few emails, etc. Okay. Thanks, right, Andrew. Thanks. thanks. Oh, I'm feeling so patriotic right now. I just <laughs> want to wrap myself up no. in a flag, which, of course, would be desecrating it. But That's still. true. No. <laughs> um, but he has a good point. It's, what, what I was going to say earlier, uh, that, you know, you, there are a lot of rank-and-file Muslims yeah. who aren't out there, you know, <coughs> the sword for Allah. We had to, I, when I was right. a little boy, we, we lived in uh, Dubai. Which is not, which back then was not what it is today. You know, sort of the Disneyland business of the Middle East. mecca. Right. Yeah, they just skyscrapers. With, we're lucky. They, they've got the indoor ski resort now, mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah, that's they've got, awesome. I want to go there. It's a it's berserk. <laughs> and yeah. I also want them to go bankrupt, and <laughs> <laughs> so that all that stuff's cheap, and you can build like an eight thousand square foot villa. Yeah, for, sure, you know. right. Um, no, but you know, we had uh, so we had our house boy, right? And we would find him like during <laughs> Ramadan. Okay, like sneaking food out of the fridge, right, at night, middle of the <laughs> night. So, you know, it's just, there's, there's, there's regular folks, right, who just don't really, they kind of like, well, I have to live with this, but sort of. So, um, so in terms of like all is, uh, you know, Muslims being these fundamentalist Islamists, well, that's not really the case. But again, what you have are the, the worst noisemakers, uh, you know, just cow all everyone else, make everyone else afraid, and, and they just intimidate everybody. Yeah, and you uh, kind of have that here, too, with the Christians. Yeah, but not so much, right? Because, again, you still don't, Christians still don't have the, rep I mean, okay, you get the guys walking in and shooting abortion doctors, but you still don't have, the, the reputation for violence is not as strong as it is with <coughs> Muslims. And so, um, but... I, it's a it's a tricky situation. He's I liked your idea, though. I wanted to say, which it, which mm -hmm. is to play the system yeah. by just trumping up being offended by everything. Right. Because I mean, oh, you know, okay. if if you're not gonna be able to change the rules, then I'm a very strong proponent of using the rules to your best advantage. Yeah, to show how ridiculous <laughs> the rules are. Right. Right. So. Okay. All right. Uh, control room. You say that Steve is still online too, and yeah, we he need hasn't to update, been for a while. We need to so update our phone check phone that list, out. Guys. Uh, but we do have James in San Diego. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for holding. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question, kind of co question comment. Um, <coughs> this is my first time on the show, actually. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I'm wondering is, what do you guys think of the whole mega church thing? Because I know it's been around maybe 30 years in the USA. I was, and especially out here in California, you have a lot of the Calvary chapels. I don't know, are you guys familiar with California too much? The religious, the religious um, spectrum out here. Oh, we have plenty of mega churches here. In fact, yeah. that's what. What uh, my fiance and I went yeah. to last month. I, I suspect that the, that we have probably even more of them down here in Old Tejas, you know, bet, which is yeah. South Central, you know, BFE Jesus Land, right? So. I want to know Osteen because I, everybody <laughs> not, they, they don't really like him in California too much. I know he was just down to your Joel Osteen Lakewood Church, you know. In yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, I bet you guys do this. That they're not, they have a high turnover rate in that church. Those mega churches, especially Joel Osteen, they'll only stay there for one to three years and then they'll leave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I, 
You know, there are, there are uh, fundamentalists, right? They are? No, no. I was going to say, fundamentalists hate guys like Joel Osteen right, and right. Rick Warren. And so, because what they've done is they have... Um, Commoditized? Well, co or commodified. Yeah, they've, well, yeah. well they, they're, they're essentially being really honest about doing what all the other churches really are doing and hoping you don't notice, which is <laughs> it's a big business, right? It's about the money. Right, just bring right, just right, bring yeah. them in and cycle that cash through, and and we have hundreds of millions of dollars coming through, and that we don't have to pay taxes on, and that totally rocks, and we love it, and you and and they are able to get these people through, because uh, and and there is a high turnover among the attendees because what they're getting is these are people who want to have sort of like a church home right. and that kind of feeling right, of community. Right. But, but you know, they're not really like hardcore Jesus-thumping, you know, wild asses in terms of, you know, being, right, being super right. fundies. I've read, I've read almost all three of his books because I consider yeah. myself to be right now um, not even agnostic. I'm a free thinker, non-religious. But um, yeah. I, I went through the whole book thing. I read his books. And he sounds, if you ever listen to Osteen, he sounds like a robot. He sounds like a... Um, very repetitious. He says the same thing over and over and over. Well, what he is is he's a, he's a, he's doing motivational speaking. Okay, he's a, you know he's essentially preaching led to motivational speaking, right? And then now yeah. they've brought it back into a church format. So he, as a preacher, he is doing it as a motivational speaker, and that's how he's able to get a larger percentage, a much huger, you know, thirty-five thousand people in a mega church as opposed to his little, you know, regular little churches, simply because he makes it all generic. You know, right, he'll right, have a right. few platitudes and, about God that aren't right. so strong that they alienate people, but it's mainly all about, you yeah, feel it, good and you can do anything and everything's awesome and you're great. It doesn't but, surprise you know, me that there's a high turnover. I mean, California, we have the whole Calvary Chapel thing. Are you guys familiar with them? Chuck Smith, Calvary Chapel? Um, not yeah. specifically, but we probably Maybe. know the, the, the type, yeah. Well, they've been around since the 70s or so. I'm only 32. But what I mean is, it seems like wherever you go, the mega churches are kind of different. Out here, they're cool churches. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No, they're they're just like that here, too. Yeah. I, I mean, they're like you see signs on billboards with, like, a pair of grungy jeans on, on legs, and then yeah. there's a guitar lying around. And I, I got a flyer. Like, come to our church. I uh -huh. got a flyer from a, a, a it's, I think it's a wannabe megachurch. It's a new church here, like, in my end of town, south of town. Um, you know, and, and the front of the flyer said on it, in big red sort of MTV-ish looking letters, church sucks. That was their sales pitch for the, to, for bringing me to their church. Oh and on God. the back, it, and on the back, then it was like, yeah, but but our church is cool, right? And you can you can wear your jeans with holes in them and bring your iPod because you know because it totally rocks here, right? That's how yeah. they're that's how they're selling it. It, so, it comes right. across as I a bunch bring that flyer. of. I kept that flyer. It I'll comes it. across as a bunch of old guys in suits trying to figure out how to talk to the teen demographic. Precisely. Yeah. So it's all it's so uh, the you know the mega churches are essentially I think. <laughs> In a sense, you can sort of deplore them because they're big and they're everywhere and they're like, oh, hang on. But, uh, but at the same time, I kind of have to give them props for just being honest about what they are, which is a multi-million dollar business. <laughs> It is. It's, it's a you business. Huh? Now, have you guys ever? They have this corny thing now. They have a. In fact, you just make you got mad. They have a Christian books, Christian clothing store inside the mall here in San Diego. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm sure they that. Yeah. have a, a Christian. I don't know if Marilyn ever told you that before. Well, there, there's all kinds I mean, of Christian. I mean, you'll you'll find Christian coffee shops and Christian bookstores and this and that. And the yeah, other, there, there's there's a Christian to, yellow pages here. I mean, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. So but, um, they it's have around. a thing called NOTW, and it's like it looks so corny. It says "Not of this world." They they put it oh, in the cars yeah. and stuff. And it all looks gangster with the t-shirts. Yeah, we know. It's again, it's 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 a business. It's a business. It is. And, huh. and they're at least they're being honest about we're just making money here. You know, so yeah. I bet we I could a, really get some big business from those yeah. kids today with their hippity yeah. hop. Right. Well, and you know what I'm too is um, why do mm -hmm. a lot of people grow up Catholic, right? But then they change to these mega churches. Why do a lot of people leave the Catholic church and go to those mega churches? Oh, uh, we don't know and we don't care. I mean, because marketing us, works. Yeah. If marketing it didn't, works. they wouldn't do it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but listen, we got to get to our next guy. All right. <laughs> okay. Thanks yeah. for calling. Bye. Uh, mm. Um. Actually, I I was just remembering. Uh, you know, Wretched Radio, what's that guy's name? Todd Friel. Yes, okay. Todd Friel. I, I listened to him once do a big rant about Veggie Tales. 
Um, and and his thing there was that oh sure it's nice to get the kids in uh, you know uh -huh. thinking that this is all nice happy stuff but then they grow up and they're like used to thinking of Jesus in the same context as Barney the dinosaur and and you know their cartoons and then and then that makes yes, them more likely to turn away from the church yes that's the whole point because <laughs> yeah. that's what Jesus is he's a storybook character. Yeah, and, yeah. and I mean, my, my thing is, you know, he, he's all worried about them making kids think of him that way. And it's like, no, 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 no. They're catering to them. <laughs> because church is already dull unless you unless you make up these silly stories about them uh, and it's not and you know ultimately you're damned if you do damned if you don't because if you keep the boring stories then you're gonna lose members because your church is lame and if you just make them sound hip then uh, you know or you know you certainly don't want to encourage critical thinking because that'll oh, turn them away. So. yeah yeah so uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think this may be our last call, and if you're in Austin, you should join it. Totally join us. Yes, after come to, come to supper. Red Gills, and I'll bring that there. flyer next time I'm on the show. I'll, yep, I'll, I'll scan it and I'll put it on the blog. That's all I'll do. Uh, Logan in otherwise. North Carolina. Logan, are you there? Hi. Can hey. you guys hear me? All right. You're Hi. on. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I was just wanting to ask you guys how you dealt with people presenting you with arguments of their faith um, from miracle. And um, because, like, I just had a, an evangelical Christian come up to me just last night, um, you know, trying to convert me to Christianity and whatnot, and his exclusive argument was arguments from miracle. And basically what I had to do was I had to, um, like, he would present me with one of his, you know, uh, vastly unsupported claims and... Uh, well, like, give us something. What did he say? What did he say? Yeah. Uh, well, like, like for example, he would just say, um, uh, one of my friends, um, uh, you know, had a a leg that was shorter than the other one, and uh, she watched it grow, you know, like a, a whole foot. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, just, just, uh. these, just these wild sort of claims. And, um, you know, I basically had to go through each one of his claims one by one and give... An explanation for... Yeah, okay, wait. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you a technique that I learned from Jeff. I like it very much. Okay. When somebody comes at you, and, and they're going to want to, like, throw as much stuff mm -hmm. at you as you can, because they know that your time is limited, and they can take 30 seconds to say something, and you have to, like, take 10 minutes to research it. Right. And, and you just don't have the time for that. When you get somebody doing that, the, fir the first thing you need to say is, okay... Hit me with your single very best miracle, mm -hmm. okay? What is the one thing that is the most convincing? Then you deal with that one, and then they try to change the subject, and you say, hang on, hang on. If your best miracle wasn't good enough, then why are you trying to bring up a different one? Yeah. you, you, know. you got to keep it focused is yeah, what you, I'm saying. You brought your A game. It failed. Your B game is not going to work, you know? Um, yeah. But <laughs> it's... Um, you're dealing with an irrational thinker there, right? I mean, you're dealing with someone who has just convinced himself, uh, you know, that uh, these unusual, miraculous events occur. He knows that, it, you know, <coughs> he knows that he can't prove them. He must know that he can't prove these things happen to right. you. I mean, how does he say, you know, it all comes down to, you know, just tell him, okay, you're making extraordinary claims. They require extraordinary evidence. Um, you know, how, how do I know that any of these things you're telling me actually happened? You know, he may bring up prayer uh, as a thing. It's like, oh, well, somebody prayed that their mother would be cured from cancer, and then their mother was cured from cancer. And you're like, okay, well, uh, what about all the other people who have cancer? And they get prayed for, and then they don't get cured from their cancer. Well, so does a God mean that he just decided to like this one cancer victim th on this particular day and not the millions of others? Um, you know, miracles are just very selective things that, um, and, and yeah. as Russell said, they'll just hit you with so many of them that you can't refu possibly refute them all. We're running out of time, oh, so drats. I'm going to have to let you go. But, I mean, the Sorry. one thing that I want to leave this on is that you shouldn't let anybody change the subject without strongly making a note of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, even if it's just to say, I acknowledge that you're changing the subject. Can we agree that that one wasn't good enough? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for watching. See you at Thread Gills.
tv at atheist-community.org is the address if you didn't get it on today. Thanks for a great show. Could have used some more uh, contradictory callers, but, but still always fun to be on with you, Martin. Yeah, See you later. Yeah, likewise, Russell. Definitely. <laughs>